Hello, I'm Michael Hainsworth. Canada is living in interesting times. Our biggest trading partner is running an election that will determine the world order for a generation. Our trade agreement with the United States is up for review in 2026. And foreign disinformation campaigns are threatening the integrity of democracies worldwide. Who better to prepare us for what's to come than David Cohen? Cohen is an American businessman, lawyer, lobbyist, and the United States ambassador to Canada. He joins us now. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for having me on. I appreciate the opportunity. Now, you've pointed out that you are a very political guy, but as an ambassador, it's very hard to not be political. In what must be the most important election in U.S. history, how are you handling that? Well, I used to be a very political guy. I used to be um, actively engaged in every major, and some would say, including my wife, minor political campaign that crossed my radar screen. Um, but I'll, I'll say there is a, there is, um, there's a, a form of relief being an ambassador and not having to have that intense engagement in this political campaign. Um, it, it's hard at times because um, I have a lot of friends who are running for office um, and by the way, I, I, I want to say this, I, you're probably referring to the presidential campaign. And one of the things I struggle with in, in explaining in Canada is that you know, around federal elections, the focus is on who's the prime minister. I'm a, a Canadian getting a ballot in a federal election. There'll be one race on the ballot. Um, in the United States, we have dozens and dozens of elections. So... I mean, I actually just filled out my uh, my mail ballot in Pennsylvania. There were 40 races on the election. So when you talk about engagement in politics, I mean, I have engagement, sure, in presidential election, but in Senate elections, congressional elections, mayoral, gubernatorial, um, state general assemblies, city councils, um, judges in Pennsylvania. So uh, politics in Pennsylvania politics in the United States can be all-encompassing. Um, and it's taken a little bit of getting used to to have be completely distant from it, but I understand the reasons for it, and I'm actually comfortable with the legal requirements and appearance requirements that require me to be completely non-political in this role. Which makes my job a little more difficult. You can just deflect something that is is something that wouldn't be in your purview. But let me ask you about Canada's commitment to NATO, for example. It's been cited as a potential stumbling block in our relationship in 2025. The Minister of National Defense expects Canada will spend about 2% of its GDP on defense. By 2032, is that good enough? So the short answer to your question, and I'm not great at short answers, is yes. Um, I've been, I think I've been very consistent that the United States is, views Canada as an essential partner in defense. We have a lot of interest in Canada's investment in defense, um, but we, we don't measure Canada's commitment to defense or its investment in defense by reference to any single metric, and that includes the percentage of its GDP that Canada is spending on defense. Um, I mean, we'd like Canada to get to 2% of its GDP on defense, which is what Canada committed way back in 2015, that it would spend on defense. Um, we think that's a, that's a useful reference and metric. But by the same token, over the, over the last nine years, when Prime Minister Trudeau has been in office, We've seen a steadily increasing investment in defense by Canada, moving from about 1% of GDP to 1.37% now, with a defense policy update in place that will move Canada to 1.76% of GDP by 2029-2030, um, and then ultimately to 2% of its GDP on defense by 2032. We see a current budget that is spending more than 20, that has a more than 27% increase in defense spending, um, even though the overall budget has an increase in spending of only 3 or 4%. We see a Canada that has been readily responsive to requests for 
defense assistance made by the United States or NATO, with um, Canada, by way of example, being one of the major contributors to the to military and humanitarian assistance in Ukraine, with Canada being the number two contributor to the MSS security force in Haiti, behind only the United States, um, with Canada making new commitments in the Indo-Pacific, and maybe most significant with Canada making all series of renewed um, and new commitments around continental defense, including defense in the Arctic, around NORAD modernization, and about making investments to help um, and to play a leading role in defending our continent, homeland defense, which is something that is the highest priority for the United States in working with Canada. So when we look at the whole picture here, we're, we're, we're satisfied with where Canada is um, in terms of its commitment to defense and in helping us to meet the North American threats to security in the 21st century. It was suggested to me by Conrad Black and Martha Hall Finley on a recent episode of this program that if Canada put money, more money into defending its Arctic uh, component to its, its landscape, that that would, in the eyes of the Americans, be a contributing component to that 2% of GDP for NATO. It sounds like you're telling me that that's correct. Well, I think that's correct, but I think most of the money that Canada is spending on NORAD modernization which is essentially all spending in the Arctic on equipment, on infrastructure, on facilities, will count against the will count against Canada's NATO two percent of GDP commit of GDP commitment. So, in that sense, I think I'm saying the same thing. But um, it, I think it's all part of the of the same question. And that quest that question though flags one of the reasons why personally I have not been fixated on the 2% of GDP metric because there's a lot of money that Canada spends that we think is important, that we think is relevant for defense, but that does not count against Canada's 2% of GDP defense spending commitment. For example, the money that Canada spends on space, which is a priority area for the United States, it's a priority for Canada. And equally important is the money that Canada spends on cybersecurity, on cyber defense, and on cyber-related issues, which is an area where Canada is particularly strong, where the partnership between Canada and Canada, between Canada's CSE Enterprise and our NSA is very strong, very important for defense, and most of that spending does not count against Canada's NATO commitment and we don't want to disincent Canada from continuing to invest in that very important area. I want to pick up on your, your point about cybersecurity because you know, NATO is seen as a bulwark against Russia and Vladimir Putin. And despite the invasion of Ukraine, Russia's primary weapon against the West for decades now has been disinformation. How do we undo the damage? So um, I understand your bridge. Let me, be, let me be clear that when I talk about cybersecurity, I'm not really talking about this information. And this information sure. might be, a, might be a, a very small subset of cybersecurity. Cybersecurity, I'm talking about a place, by the way, where Russia is strong and where Russia is active. You see news stories about Russia attacking critical infrastructure, like utility infrastructure. Cybersecurity is defense against those type of cyber attacks. Disinformation, misinformation, election interference is a whole different battlefield. And you're right, it is an area where Russia and some of our other less than friendly um, compatriots around the world are very actively engaged. It's receiving a lot of attention in Canada. Um, and anytime there's an election year, it receives more more um, attention. It is certainly the subject of a lot of attention in the United States, um, and we have a number of a number of tactics, a number of strategies, a number of ways that we're attacking that. State Department 
has a global engagement center, which is focused on identifying attempted uses of misinformation and disinformation, uh, per, even short of, of leading to election interference, because you could just have misinformation and disinformation that confuses the public, potentially turns the public off to a particular kind of activity. You could also have disinformation that actually attempts to interfere in an election. Um, and those election interference areas are, are areas of particular concern for the United States. You can also have um, disinformation and misinformation um, that we engage with and we, um, and we take the primary weapon we have for combating disinformation and misinformation, which is exposure. When we, when we come across it, we can use um, at, we can use that information and expose the Russians or the Chinese, um, to use another example, for engaging in disinformation campaigns, which is proven to be a pretty effective tool against disinformation. And then more recently, um, and we've got a couple of cases of this literally in the last couple of months, um, the Department of Justice in the United States is starting to go after Russian disinformation criminally. So there was an indictment uh, against two individuals who work for RT, which is a Russian news service who were indicted for, um, for basically um, engaging in disinformation campaigns designed to influence elections in the United States. And shortly after that, there was an unsealed indictment in my hometown of Philadelphia um, exposing with the Justice Department and the Philadelphia FBI called the doppelganger scheme, which was a scheme that the FBI believes it is documented, was under the direction of a close compatriot of Vladimir Putin, absolutely highest level of leadership in Russia directed, where Russia was co-opting um, websites, was using Russian influencers, they were making up domain names like WashingtonPost.co. So it wasn't WashingtonPost.com. It was WashingtonPost.co. They were writing false stories. The typeface looked like the Washington Post. So it looked like you were reading a Washington Post story. And then this scheme, the doppelganger scheme, was they would go to American influencers and they would pitch these stories on these fake websites with these articles that look like Washington Post or Wall Street Journal articles and get American social media influencers to promote them on social media, all with a mind toward influencing the election. So there were indictments in that case. And more importantly, there were 28 domains seized by the Department of Justice legally so that they could not be used by the Russians. So that's a bit of the range of tactics that the United States is using to go after disinformation, misinformation, and election influence. It, I, I, we could fall down a rabbit hole on, on this topic, certainly. Um, and and I, I, there are so many other things I want to talk to you about. But what it sounds like your answer is telling me is that America is finally waking up to 20 years of this type of Cold War activity and is now starting to fight back. How does Canada get involved? So I'd like to think that the United States isn't exactly waking up. Um, I think we've been watching this all along. I think we've been very vigilant about it. It's interesting. I'd, I'd resist your characterization of this as a Cold War tactic because I don't think it's a Cold War tactic. I think it's a modern tactic that is very different than Cold War tactics and what the Cold War was all about. Um, and I, I do think the United States has recognized this as a serious issue of concern. Um, and I think we are very aggressively fighting back and pushing back against it in the ways that I've described and in multiple other ways. We do a lot of this in cooperation with Canada. There's a lot of conversation with Canada. Canada has its own mechanisms and tactics for fighting back 
against misinformation and disinformation. Um, there are different legal structures that exist in Canada versus the United States. So there is a public inquiry now. And as I said, we do a lot of work together in this space, collaborating, coordinating, by way of example, um, when we when we unseal the indictment in the Philadelphia-based doppelganger case, um, we provided some advance notice to Canada about that investigation and what was being done to give to to alert Canada to this type of behavior, to see whether Canada might to see whether Canada might discover similar behavior by the Russians in Canada. 2026 will mark the review of the Canada-U.S.-Mexico trade uh, agreement, as I mentioned at the start of our time together. Uh, you've been quoted as saying the agreement's going well. Is it? So we, we, the United States believes that USMCA, or just to prove I can speak a little Canadian, COSMA, as it's called in, as it's called in Canada, we think overall the agreement is going well. Um, and is uh, and is working effectively. Um, you know, I start from a fundamental proposition that the United States and Canada, has, let's remember, USMCA is a trade agreement. So I start from the, the governs our trade, governs a trade, by the way, United States, Canada, and Mexico, $1.8 trillion a year in trade among those three countries. Between the United States and Canada, we're talking about trade, of 3.4 billion Canadian dollars a day in goods and services trade crossing our border. It's our largest trade relationship. It's Canada's largest trade relationship. It produces or supports millions of jobs on both sides of the border. The vast majority of that trade is free trade, all governed under USMCA. It's a trade relationship that is the envy of the world. And all of that is subject to USMCA. So I start from that proposition of it's doing a pretty good job. It's producing the, the largest trade relationship, largest bilateral trade relationship in the world that is the envy of the world. It's easy to see why we'd be, why we, why we'd be generally happy with what's going on with, with COSMA, with USMCA. That said, there is a mandatory review after after seven years for some of USMCA, for five of the seven chapters. Interestingly, for two of the seven chapters, the there is a mandatory review after five years. That review is already occurring. Um, pretty quietly. No one's no one's throwing up red flags or warning signals that, oh my God. USMC is in trouble. USMCA is in trouble because we're treating the review process for USMCA the way we treat our overall trade relationship. We have a great relationship. We have no closer friend, partner, or ally in the world than Canada. So we're going to treat agreements and trade relationships like the friends and the allies and the partners that we are. Um, and I say, in addition to the fact that we are that we are generally satisfied with the way USMCA or COSMA is working, that a review does not mean tearing up the agreement and starting all over again. That is different than a review. It doesn't mean that the agreement sunsets or that it terminates. It means that we review it. We see how it's going. We see whether there are improvements that could be made. But... We enter this process with a general, we on the United States side, enter this process with a general satisfaction with how USMCA is working. Now, the dairy sector is small, but its influence in U.S. politics is large. Canada's supply management, uh, is this a, a big issue for Americans? Well, I think we've made quite clear that we are not happy with Canada's supply management practices under under Canada's dairy supply practices. Um, we have filed USMCA complaints. We've won one, we've sort of lost one. Um, it's a matter of ongoing conversation and negotiation. Um, but is it a reason to rip up USMCA to, to tear up uh, an agreement that's facilitating 
the trade relationship, the overall trade relationship that's the envy of the world, I think that probably would go a little far. So how should Canada be advancing its interests in the next administration? And does your answer vary depending on who ends up winning the next U.S. presidential election? So it sort of doesn't, um, because I think your question is a really good good question. I'm not sure I would put phrase it as advancing its interests in the next administration. I think I'd ask the question of how does Canada solidify its overall relationship with the United States, regardless of who the president of the United States is? Um, as I said earlier, um, we have we have elections, not an election, in 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 twenty in in twenty twenty five in twenty twenty four. Those elections include an election for president of the United States, but it include elections for a third of the United States Senate, for every member of the U.S. House of Representatives, for about 19 governors, for dozens of mayors, city council, city councils, general assemblies, and state legislators. We also power and influence is considerably more diffuse in the United States than it is in Canada. So we've got other constituency groups like the business community, organized labor, a robust think tank environment, civil society, all of whom influence the treatment of Canada and other countries, the overall relationship that exists in trade, in defense, in intelligence, in security between the United States and Canada, between the United States and other countries. And I think it's very much in Canada's interest to broaden the scope of its engagement with all of the stakeholders in the United States who influence the relationship and would benefit from a better understanding of just how important that relationship is, just how valuable that relationship is, um, just how important Canada is to that relationship. Um, And I think that um, and I think that is what Canada is trying to do with its Team Canada approach, which is which is why I've applauded it. And I the one my one comment about it, interestingly, which goes to the way you asked your question, is that I think the Team Canada approach is smart. I think it's valuable, but I think it's a mistake to tie it to a, to the 2024 presidential election or the 2024 elections. I think it's very much in Canada's interest, as I said, to make more stakeholders in the United States aware of the significance of this relationship, the value of this relationship, and the contributions that Canada makes to the overall prosperity and economic growth that occurs in North America. So expand upon that for me, please, Um, when you say that we need to expand our scope, because the the Team Canada approach so far has been to go to the border states, talk to the governors, try to reestablish that relationship, ensure that they understand the importance of that cross-border trade between whatever province it happens to be and whatever state it it is. Um, Those seem to be things we're doing already. How do we expand that scope if we're already talking to the person at the top at a state level? So I think... What you're saying is actually, it is what's happening with Team Canada now. It is not what was happening before Team Canada was unveiled again. We never went away. Team Canada exists has existed for five or six years. I think the focus of, of Canadian advocacy in the United States was disproportionately focused on the Beltway. It is the highway that surrounds Washington, D.C., not to talk in U.S. jargon here. Um, but was what happened in Washington, D.C., and even within the Beltway, what happened in the White House and in the president. I think the the unveiled Team Canada approach has been to expand the focus of Canada's outreach beyond the White House, beyond the Senate, beyond the House, beyond Washington, D.C., to governors, and I would tell, and I would say to you, it's more than the border states. For example, Prime Minister Trudeau, made a Team Canada visit to my home state, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, which is not a border state, but which has a top 10 relationship among states in the United States with Canada. Um, It was the first time 
the prime minister made, the prime minister, any senior Canadian official made a visit to Pennsylvania and engaged the governor um, and engaged the governor and representatives of the city government, Philadelphia city government, in conversations about the Canadian relationship. And Minister Champagne, by way of example, has been has been very active in engaging not only with governors, not only with border state governors, but with businesses, with business organizations like the Business Roundtable, which is a which is an organization that nobody from Canada had ever engaged with before the last year, when when um, when the Team Canada team came to me and asked for my advice. One of my pieces of advice was to engage with to was to expand the engagement beyond certainly beyond the beltway, but beyond government to engage with business. I recommend that an efficient way to do that was to increase engagement with business associations and organizations. Canadian Canadian government and Canadian businesses had engaged with the, with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, which has affiliates in Canada. They had never engaged with the Business Roundtable, which is arguably the premier business association for C- for for U.S. CEOs in the United States, and Team Canada has done that. So, and they, they've also engaged with labor, have enlisted Canadian labor organizations to engage with their counterparts. And they've enlisted. United uh, Canadian businesses and business associations to engage with their counterparts. They've engaged with U.S. based think tanks. So that's what I'm referring to when I talk about an enhanced engagement under what I'll call the modern Team Canada approach. I think that is massively in Canada's best interests. I think it has little to nothing to do with the election. I think it's all about educating all the stakeholders in the United States to the value of the U.S.-Canada relationship and Canada's major contributions to North American prosperity and innovation. To end our time together, let me ask you, what is your advice to anxious Canadians who are watching a significant portion of Americans fall in love with fascism? (laughs) I, I really don't think I agree with that characterization. But I think my answer to Canadians is, um, I think my answer to Canadians is that fundamentally, the United States has now been around for 248 years. We just celebrated our 248th birthday. Um, I think we have grown and developed into the world's most significant, most noticeable, most recognizable, and most durable democracy. Democracy is not a form of government that is um, that is typified by fascism, um, and I think that Canadians can have confidence that no matter what happens in one election, one election out of many, that is going to be taking place in in about a month in the United States, that the United States will continue to be one of the world's most powerful, important and durable democracies. Democracy has a way of prevailing. It can be a little messy at times, but it has a way of prevailing. And the history of the United States has been when we've had challenging times, and there's no doubt that that there are challenging times in the United States right now, that democracy has always prevailed and that the United States has come out of the other end of the tunnel with a more powerful, more impressive, a more durable democracy. And my advice to Canadians is that that is what is going to happen in 2024 and beyond. If there was one thing you would want the viewer to walk away with, take away from our conversation today, what should So in be? speaking to my, my friends in Canada, after three years, I, I would say that I have a lot of friends in Canada. I would say that there is no reason for Canada to be defensive about the United States-Canada relationship. As President Biden has said, and if I, as I have reiterated repeatedly, the United States has no better friend, no better partner, and no better ally than Canada. Um, I sometimes cringe when I hear Canadians refer to Canada 
as the stepsister in the United States Canada relationship, um, or as um, or as the or as the or as the poor cousin um, in that relationship. Canada contributes enormous value to the United States Canada relationship. Um, as I said, Canada is a valued partner, and I think my call to Canadians is that Canada and the United States should continue to work together to double down on our efforts to nurture this great partnership, to nurture this great relationship, and to grow it moving forward. And that is the best way I know to continue to improve economic prosperity for all of North America. Mr. Cohen, thank you so much for your time and your insight today. Well, thank you very much for having me. Ambassador David Cohen, an American businessman, lawyer, lobbyist, and the United States Ambassador to Canada. This conversation is just the tip of the Institute iceberg. Join the Institute to see great speakers like Mr. Cohen in person at the Young Street headquarters in downtown Toronto. I'm Michael Hainsworth. Thank you for joining us. You've been listening to the C.D. Howe Institute podcast with Michael Hainsworth. Subscribe on iTunes, Google Play, and Spotify. The C.D. Howe Institute is an independent, not-for-profit research institute whose mission is to raise living standards by fostering economically sound public policies. The Institute is widely considered to be Canada's most influential think tank and a trusted source of essential policy intelligence, distinguished by nonpartisan, evidence-based research and subject to definitive expert review. Visit cdhow.org and follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn. Thank you.